Welcome to a deep dive video on the Line Scale 3. This video is going to keep getting updated as I get new information. If things change, this video should stay relevant for most time. And we have a break test video on the main How Not To channel that is more entertaining for more of a larger audience. That was fun. It was <laughs> expensive. And I wanted to separate that video from the How To Use It video because this is going to get into the weeds, which is going to be very nice for anybody who owns this thing. And it's not important for anybody who doesn't own this thing, but it is interesting to see what they break out if you didn't own it. Now, what's great about the Line Scale 3 is it has a lot of features. The negative side of the Line Scale 3 is it has a lot of features. And so if you happen to get your Line Scale 3 right before doing a complex rope swing that has a lot of moving parts in it, the night before and you open this up thinking you can just put it in the middle of the sky and unrope swingers and at anchors without having any issues, you might be disappointed. I was frustrated when I first got these because I didn't understand my tool. And when you're trying to use a drill like a hammer, it's not going to work right. But if you know how to use your tool, it can be amazing. And what's great is this is the previous generation. This is the line scale two. And uh, these are pretty nice. However, it wasn't worth making another run of 100 or whatever he was making these in batches or 20. Uh, it's expensive to make a batch of these, right? Uh, so I said, I would love to see one that was faster because this only goes up to 40 hertz, 40 times per second. This goes up to 1280 hertz. And you kind of need something that's around that 1000 hertz rate in order to do drop tests. And I really wanted to have a line scale that an all-in-one that would be able to do something that was more of a shock load or a climbing whipper fall or a highline whipper or drop tower stuff. This was actually, my drop tower was designed around using this. Uh, since COVID happened and it took so long for things to come out, I ended up getting a 10,000 hertz load cell uh, with the cable coming out of the side like they all have because electricity is going in and it's measuring the, how much electricity is coming out. And I ended up getting that. It goes into a computer and I made it work, but it was great because I was able to see that 1280 Hertz is plenty fast enough for almost anything you're gonna do. If you are gonna do something like steel wire so cable that has zero, zero, zero stretch, uh, and you're gonna shock load that, you might want 2000 Hertz, but that's pretty rare. I can actually, I believe do some Dyneema drop tests with this, but rarely am I doing Dyneema drop tests. Any any other material you test is going to have enough stretch in order for this to pick it up. And that's for drop tests uh, or whipper tests, rope swing tests, whippers in the gym, whatever you're going to use this for, it's going to service that need. The other thing is I wanted it to remember stuff. And uh, it's, it's really nice when you're using this that it has internal memory. How hard can that be, right? Apparently, apparently every feature you add adds complexity. In order to get the factory to answer their email for this request for them to make all the changes in it, he needed to order a thousand of them. And so he needed to raise $300,000 in order to make that happen. He didn't have $300,000. I was like, well, I think enough people are going to be interested in this. Why don't we crowdfund? Since I was on the investor side of this equation, uh, I wanted it to be a very sweet deal. So within four days of making a video that technically didn't have that many views, when I did the break tests of this, we got... 150 people to invest $2,000 into this project. And for that, they got a free line scale three. And as they all sell of that thousand unit batch, uh, they get all their money back. And Andy Redrick doesn't really take home anything other than uh, like some cost to keep, we need him to keep the lights on uh, before the investors get their money back. I actually invested in seven of them because I uh, believed in this project. I thought these things would uh, really changed the game for how not to and what I'm trying to do here and hopefully for other people who wanted to do the same thing. Everything is going to be timestamped below on how to interact with this, how the buttons work, how to incorporate this into brake test machines, how not to break them. I've broken, I think, four of them now. And hopefully you can learn from my mistakes. Um, they can be repaired up to a point. <laughs> not not all of them can be repaired, but that was intended to be fully broken. But I think it's nice that you know the history of this 
So you understand that it was a group effort in order to get this thing to production for something that is complex and doesn't really have a huge market, but it's really changed the game. And I wanted to have this in the hands of everybody. And the description is gonna be extremely helpful. It's gonna have the Facebook group that has a, a ton of info. Anything that happens basically goes on that. Uh, links to the specific parts of the website that will explain different things to you. Uh, other videos people may have made. So the description is gonna be a very valuable resource for you guys. I wanna dive into the physical aspects of this. We'll get into the buttons after that. And then we'll get into the nuances of how to incorporate it into a, a drop tower or a slow pull thing. But typically, I believe most people are buying these things in order to find out what the live load is either on their slack lines, while they're climbing, while they're working rope access, doing trainings, small experiments. And uh, even if you are just doing something that's pulling, let's say, from with the back of a truck, um, you, you want to protect it. And the case that it comes in is not how you do it. I've learned that the hard way. We'll get into that uh, probably more towards the end of this video. You can see that in the time description below. Skip to the part you want. Let's get into the physical aspect of this. If you removed the back of this, the guts look something like this, even though this is a line scale too. The battery is glued to the back and the back panel is also technically glued in order for it to be IP65 waterproof, which means it can get some rain on it and it's not the end of the world, though I recommend covering it a little bit if it is going to rain out, but it is not submergible but I've never had a problem with water. Just respect the fact that it's not submergible device. This is a single block of aviation aluminum, which is why this one broke at 140 kilonewtons and they are super strong enough. Uh, the bodies actually uh, PPE rated for the line scale three. There was not enough money from the line scale twos in order to do that. That's why the line scale two says no person, even though the same body is now rated UIAA PPE and uh, future uh, NFPA or something like that later. But anyways, um, you can use this in rope access now. I believe in redundancy. There's still a way to do that, but the device itself is super strong enough. Now, the way it measures force is there's voltage that goes in these wires that are glued to the inside of this thing. And as this changes shape ever so slightly, the voltage going in is being changed as it comes out. When it's being calibrated, it sits with no force and whatever that voltage is, that means zero. And then they put a 10 millimeter pin right here and they pull it to one kilonewton and it interprets what that voltage is, three, five, seven, nine, all the way up. And it records what those voltages are. It does the math in between all of those. And that way it knows when it deforms this much, that means you have 3.79 kilonewtons. However, if you squeeze it sideways, it's obviously torquing it different. If you bend it this way, you can see that it's turning it and torquing it in different ways. When I go like that, I can bend it to 0.2 kilonewtons. So it's important to understand how they've told this dumb machine what is what, because if you pull it like this with your whole hand, it's gonna pull differently than if you pulled with just your finger. So that is important to understand that if you were to take a sling, which is perfectly fine to do, but if you girth hitch it, then it's not pulling evenly on this. And that can give you a slightly false reading. If you wanted to use a sling, you could do it in a basket shape, which pulls more evenly. And if I did do this, I would dress it up a little bit. So it was pulling dead center. The more I've respected how I pull on this, the more accurate the numbers are for me. Now you notice the difference. This has a solid back and this has a removable back. And the reason is that this is what you would get in the mail today if you were to buy one is the problem they were trying to solve was if you put this carabiner on there and you can see it's not pulling evenly, especially if you can see that gap right there, pull it on this side, it's not pulling straight and it's kind of torquing it. And it would give kind of a false reading. Even though this now supposedly fixes the problem, it's just nice that it's less sensitive to that problem, but I still recommend pulling it the way it was designed to be pulled, like this. Or if you have a shackle pin, you can pull very flat and even, just like this, giving you a more accurate reading. If I had that one piece of advice when I first got these, a whole bunch of videos would have turned out better. 
if I wanted to take care of this nicely, it's nice to have something soft on there rather than a bunch of metal on metal, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, the sling's a very nice option and a soft shackle is as well. And you can pull like that. What's nice about a sling is you can buy these off the shelf for a couple dollars. What's nice is this is a 60 centimeter. I recommend a 30 centimeter. That way it's not too long. And this is also an 1 8 inch Dyneema soft shackle, which is plenty strong enough. And you don't necessarily want this to be too strong because this is going to break around 50 kilonewtons. This is going to break around 20, but there's a lot of variation with these. This in a basket, if it's rated for 20 kilonewtons, in theory, in a basket shape, it would give me 40. You never get that quite. So you could probably bank on that breaking around 35. Now, the problem with that breaking and before this breaks, if you're trying to pull something with a truck, for example, it's going to go flying the opposite direction you're expecting. And that's what happens to most of my line scales. That's why I have problems. So you got to prevent things you're not expecting. Pretty hard, right? Now, it wasn't just because they went with removable back, but they silicone the strain gauges on the inside and they did different soldering points in order to avoid the, the torquing problem. So every generation of this is getting better and every firmware update is getting better as well. Now, metal shrinks and expands when the temperature changes. It's not much, but this is a sensitive device. And if you don't know that, you might be frustrated when you're in Iceland and it's not calibrated at that temperature. What I get do to get around extreme temperatures is I play in relative mode. I actually play in relative mode most of the time. Right now I'm in room temperature and it's reading zero like it's supposed to. But if it's not, temperature could be one of the biggest um, issues you might be having. Now you have two micro USB ports here and the charging port allows you to charge this while the data is being extracted, which sometimes can take a while if you have a lot. The data comes off with a memory stick that is provided with line scale, where it's a micro USB on this side, and then you plug that into your computer after you extract it, not at the same time. And then the charging port, you want five volt, one amp. Now you can do two amp if you have a fast charging situation. It's not as good for the battery. The slower you charge this, the better it'll be. Even 0.5 amps will be better for this than uh, one amp. Now this is programmed in order to shut off before the battery gets to some critical level. So you're not really going to permanently damage the battery because if it gets super, super empty, it is bad for it. Now batteries like to be full. They store better full. They last longer if they're full. So if you keep it between 20 and 80%, which you can see on the battery uh, bar, that's gonna keep your battery lasting a longer time. You don't want to charge this when it's freezing outside or even five degrees Celsius, which I believe is like 40 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take. So don't charge this when it's super cold and keep it charged. Now you're not gonna be charging and discharging this battery more than a cell phone. So this actually lasts more than five years. You just don't want to keep it stored in a closet on zero and you don't wanna be storing this in extreme heats and extreme cold or you will wear it out. Now, for a guy who has nothing but problems with every load cell he has, I've never had an issue with battery. These things will last 30 hours if you're constantly playing with it, 20 if your Bluetooth is connected the entire time, or 60 hours if it's in standby mode. So you may notice that this screen looks a little bit crisper in a cell phone. I actually turned out some of the lights in my uh, pull, slow pull machine here. You can see the little, just a slight little flicker refresh rate happening. This is an OLED screen and this is an LED screen. Now it's a little bit of a pain on a cell phone to change the exposure rate because it kind of blows everything out in the background. So oftentimes you'll see in videos that I'm making that I'll cover like this and then I'm filming right up close to it. You just need a little shade in order for uh, you to be able to record this. I don't know how many people are trying to make videos with these things. It might only be a me problem, but this is why the line scale 2 does this and the OLED screen is why the line scale three does this. The OLED thing is better for everything except what I'm trying to do with it. Now to wrap up the physical aspects of this, you can get a case. This is a plastic case. There's also an aluminum case available. I don't recommend using the case as a protector while using the device because it the meat slides out of the sandwich if you're trying to break stuff and all of a sudden it goes from zero to fast. <laughs> I've broken enough stuff now. Don't try to use a box. Uh, I have another solution we'll talk about at the end of the video. And as we 
as we perfect that solution, I will update the end of that video. And when we re-upload it here on How Not To Clips, uh, the kind of re-notifies everybody that subscribed, like, hey, there's a new video, and it's, hey, psych, it's this one, but it's updated. So uh, better than uh, having an outdated video or having to reshoot this from scratch every time. What is nice about the case is if you are going to throw this in a haul bag, for example, or you're going to be traveling with it in a way that um, you're not too crammed for space, this is actually a great way to take it. You can put your, your cord right there and you don't want to lose this little tiny guy. This is a key component in order to update the firmware because to make things simple is complex and you only have so many resources before you run out of juice. And it's not that big of a deal. It just sits right there in the corner of that thing. You're not likely to lose it then. This guy sits right here and you have everything you need in this case. What I don't like that for is when I'm traveling on an airplane, I don't want to take three of these, which this might only be a me thing, I don't know. Uh, but when I take a stack of these, I can take, uh, this is assuming you have three of these, but uh, you can see that it compacts a lot nicer if you just keep them in their fabric case and um, you don't need all the accessories for all three of them. But I don't know, this is great for so many things. Mm. Now, another way to protect the screen is to take this rubber piece and you place it right in there. It fits like a glove and you can take two rubber bands and you can wrap it around on both sides. It'll stay in place. Now, if you take a rubber band to this, you're squeezing it ever so slightly, but that's all it takes in order to throw it off by a little bit. So something to be aware of, but this is definitely nice to have. What you can do is you can set relative zero once it's on there and then you are good to go. Relative zero is basically the hack to use this thing. Now we're gonna cover what all the buttons and icons mean, and then we're gonna cover the settings. Now, in order to turn it on, you long hold the on button, and you can see the time and date right there. We'll show you how to get to that later. And you have here menu, which you would short push in order to get there. You have up and down, so I'm gonna go up in order to get there, and that is the enter sign on zero. So these four buttons all do similar things. If you want to change the speed, right now we're at 40 hertz, 640, 1280, 10. Unit, you can see here kilonewtons, kilograms of force, pounds of force. If you wanna zero this out because maybe the sun was on it or something and it's not zero, or you have a weight on there and you wanna see the difference, you would push zero and then it's gonna read zero. But now when I let go, it's going to not have zero. So I oftentimes push zero every time I do a test if it's not behaving. You wanna be careful pushing zero if you already have, let's say a slack line rigged and it's under two kilonewtons of tension, you don't wanna push zero. Otherwise you've got to kind of derig to get it back to zero. Otherwise, you're going to be going off the ABS, which you can change mode. Now you long hold to get into these things in order to get to absolute zero mode. Now, if it's in absolute zero mode and I push zero, it's resetting peak force because the peak force 0 0.8, 0 0.84, it's going to reset that max force. Now this is going to show me the live number and that's going to show me the max force. But if I go, let's go back to relative zero, then you're not going to get peak force unless you hold down peak. So you're in a long hold unit and you're going to have peak force. There you go. Now this will capture this. So let me show you something. Now, if you push zero while in peak mode, it's going to reset your peak mode. If you want to reset your relative zero, which it would be reading there, we're exiting peak display. Right now it's reading zero. But if I want to do this and I push zero, relative zero is now set. If I want to go peak, now is zero, but if I let go, it's obviously the negative 20. So that's the live force of relative zero. And so relative peak mode, if I take it up high and I push zero, 
then it's going to reset my peak force. But if I want to reset the relative force, I'm going to long hold peak or long hold unit to get to peak. Then I can set zero. Everything is great. It's in the sun. It changed by 0.05 or something. And now I can go back into peak mode. And it is important to check that. Now, what happens if you were not in peak mode and you were to pull something and you're like, oh, shoot, I missed the peak force. If I wasn't in peak mode and I put it up like that, it doesn't show anywhere my peak force. But if I go like this, it did retain that information. And then, of course, you can push zero. So you have to play with that. You have to decide what you're doing with it and what you're going to want. Now, as far as logging, that's the memory that's inside of this, which is the amazing part of this thing, is right now I have log is off. If I don't need the log, I don't turn it on. Now, the log is where a lot of this complexity happens. That, of course, is the battery. This is not the battery. That's the battery. This is your memory. And it doesn't matter how big the log is. It could be a 1280 hertz log or a 10 hertz log. It could be for one second. It could be the max time that it's allowed, which we'll get into. It has 100 slots for memory. And it depends what you're doing. I've never found I needed, honestly, more than 15 or 20. You just don't want it to just trigger, 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 and then it fills it up. Now, you do not long hold the on button in order to get the menu. Everything else you long hold. You push it quickly, and then you're there. And when you do that, you can now see what version you have. You can see what time it is, and you can see the date. And it's important to change this when you're getting it from another country because I didn't. And to line up on a rope swing where I had five of these is a nightmare. <laughs> now, no matter where you are in the menu, you don't have to go to return at any point. Let's go here. Any point, you can just short push this and it'll just take you back and you don't have to push exit. You can just short push that. It'll take you back. So as we navigate this, we have up, down, and enter. That's what the arrow, arrow, and that's what that is. So let's get into log. Clear memory log. That is, in this case, I don't have anything on here I care about. So I'm going to go, yes. Everything is deleted. Onboard logging can be done here, on, or it can be done by long holding log. They both work. Overwrite oldest log. This is a circle with an arrow, which means when this memory runs out, it's going to overwrite the oldest one. You have to think hard about whether or not you want that to happen. Now, the safe thing to do is have S on, which is single recording. And then what happens is if I trigger this, log is on, it's going to trigger 10 hertz. It's recording, it's recording. And you can see here, the time is counting down and that the record is on. And after it's done recording, it saved the memory and turned my log off, which is why it's in single mode. So if I accidentally keep it over 0.75 because I didn't set my trigger right. And let's say I was rope swinging and the person's one and a half kilonewtons. That's a lot, but with maybe the ropes and the gear, whatever. And they just are trigger, 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 trigger. You're going to just fill this up and you're going to have only one useful log out of 50. It really sucks. Uh, but you also don't want to trigger it right before going because you've set it low and then it records once and you miss your recording. So yeah, good luck with that. Let's go back into the menu option. So here is always the biggest debate. When do you want to start your trigger? Let's use a rope swing, for example. If I push enter, I'm going to push enter to move that over. Uh, I know that I only weigh 0.7, and I know I'm going to generate at least one and a half. So... 1.75 is good enough for that. Now, in trigger is just like you think. If it's set to zero, it's not going to ever end, even if it touches zero. So if you want it to work, I recommend you going to here. So after the force is off of the thing, then it'll just stop recording. However, on a free fall of a drop test, it goes to zero for a little bit, for a short moment. And then if it stopped recording right before the drop test and the peak force, you're going to miss it. So I often keep that at zero. If you're reading a slack line and this is a constant two kilonewtons load with no one on it, if it ever touches that, you don't need it to be triggered. 
But if somebody's walking, it's always going to be, let's say, three kilonewtons. If they're whipping, it'll be four or five. Then you would set your end trigger to be at that resting force when no one's on it. So there's a benefit to everything and there's a downside to everything. But I'm a brake test guy, so I keep it to zero. Scan rate. Uh, you don't want it to be faster than you need it. Uh, if you're going to slow pull something, 10 hertz. If you're pulling something with your truck, 10 hertz. If you're just sitting on it uh, and you just want to know how much force you're putting on something or two legs of an anchor, 10 hertz. Uh, if you're really not sure, you can go 40 640, um, it depends if you're drop testing, let's say nylon products that are stretchy, that, that would work. 1280 is where you're going to be limited how long you can record something. Let's go 1280. Enter, down. The max log record time, if you push enter and you push that up to one, that's obviously a lot of seconds, it won't let you do that. So you push enter, enter, and you go all the way through. 15 seconds is the maximum time. And so if you're not sure how much, let's see, we go back up here, 640. And I don't know how many seconds, I want it to be more. Then I would push one. And the max force is, thir or max time is 30 seconds. So if you're ever quite not sure what you can get out of your unit, let's go to 10 max record time 19 20 seconds i think that's 30 minutes and so if you're trying to do like a longer session that might be nice so if you're trying to record whippers on a high line you could set your scan rate to 640 you definitely don't need more than that if you do you're going to break your back this is going to be too much of a shock load Max log record time would be 30 seconds. It shortened it because it obviously isn't going to do the previous one. If you wanted something really long, let's say you wanted to measure a high line the entire time you're walking like a big one, you don't need more than, let's say, 40 hertz. And that should pick up most uh, whippers because there's enough stretch in high lines in order for it to be super safe enough. Set max log record time. So I do that in order to get the highest number it'll allow me to have, which is 480 seconds. But if you want to do a minimum log record time, because you have a capture in trigger, you want it to at least capture a specific amount of time. Because if it goes up and down really fast, you'd have like that much data. So it's nice to have five seconds, let's say. Now pre-capture record time, you can do quite a bit with the 10 Hertz and with the 1280 Hertz, then uh, you only get three seconds, which is perfect. It gives you all the information you need right before that peak force happened. So I always keep it at three seconds. Logging type. Um, you got it. You got it. You got to know what's going on here. Yeah, single log. If you put this out in the middle of a high line and you're not going to babysit it, uh, the, you're going to be quite upset if you find out you had single log. Enter. Up. Continuous logging. So... Return, back. so you see that C right there? That's continuous, S is single. You gotta be careful with this because the trigger is at 0.75. I'm in relative mode. I wanna zero this thing out, but when I, in this case, I'll squeeze it to above the trigger, and now we have our timer. And our, I, I reset the timer, just be 10 seconds. However, the problem is, if you're over the number again, it's just going to keep going and going and going. So if you've set this to lower than your weight, once you're sitting on the rope, it's going to just trigger, 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 and use up all of your memory, and you won't know which one is, uh, it's, it's a pain. You don't want to run out of memory because of this mistake. But you also don't want single mode on, and it triggers, and then the next person rope swings, and you don't have it on. Now, if I do that again, it's uh, doing the timer thing. You're going to see it's in S mode, single mode. As soon as it's done, the log goes to log off. And if you're not, if you got to know if you have both options. It's great. There's nothing wrong with this thing except user error. So I have had issues with that in the past. But it's just nice to have this all preset up before you go out and try some crazy stuff 
or try to break something. In order to turn log back on, I don't have to go into the menu. I just hold down log and the log's ready to go again. Zero and it's zero and I'm ready to rope swing again. Super easy. I like this. This is the mode I keep it in most of the time. Now, I don't always keep it in um, rewrite mode. So right now, it's if I ran out of this, it was just write over old logs. I don't usually do that. So my log is on. My relative force is set to zero. I'm all good to go. Everything's working. And then it's going. And I'm like, oh, no, it's 900 seconds, and I don't want that. Um, onboard logging is recording. You short push this. Are you sure you want to stop the log? Yes, I am. And it's going to just throw me in the menu, but you have to push enter. Now you'll see here, it says log is on. It did not record. It did not save all of the information, if any. But if I go back up to the trigger mode, it's going to do the 10 seconds again. So uh, you want to just make sure that says on before you go do the next test or jump or stunt uh, in order to keep track of that. Anyways, you can stop it mid recording. Now the next thing on the menu is date and time. Your date format is day, month, year, which is European, or you can go year, month, date, which is no one's preferred method. <laughs> you don't really have the American version on here. It doesn't matter. Anyways, so date is June 11th, 2023. Uh, time is 218. You can see that these two line scales are not on the same time. And so I can hit enter and I'm going to change the time. So here, if I want to synchronize this, I both get them to the seconds. They're both reading the same. And then at the same time, I just push both. And then they're going to be in sync if I want to compare the data on two of them later. And user settings, auto power off. So if you hit enter, this thing is going to turn itself off if nothing's changed within 10 minutes. Now, if you want to keep this thing running, um, turn that off. And you're risking this dying. And now it's going to last quite a while, but you're risking it dying. If nothing's happening, if no force has changed at all, and if you haven't touched the buttons in 10 minutes or in 60 minutes, um, then it will turn off. That's probably the safer option. I'm gonna keep mine at 60 minutes. Power save and lock. Do I, when do I want the screen to turn into its safe mode? Let's see here. That is not very long. Let's see what happens. Power save lock level. So you can have max power save, minimum power save, or medium. Let's see what minimum does. Auto zero tracking. Keep this off. Uh, I will show you why later. Oh God, don't turn that on unless you know you need it. Um, I have no idea what that is. So Andy explained what the UART band is. This is simply the USB connection speed if you want it to go to a computer. So why not simply just fix it to the max speed? Because some cables suck and some cables that are longer than two meters might not work with the 480 kilobytes per second. That's nerdy. Let me show you the auto zero tracking. I have it on uh, 10 DIV. Uh, it goes all the way down to here. It's not as sensitive when it has 0.5. I always have mine at off. And you'll see why now after I show you this. So if I set it to 10, and I had mine like this for a while, and it was so frustrating. So right now I'm in relative mode. And you can see ABS and everything. If I lay it flat, zero, zero, it's all great. And I'm going to slowly squeeze it because I can get some pretty big numbers this way. And you can see as I very slowly squeeze it, that ABS is going up. They both started at zero. And what's happening is if this is within 0.1 of something, it's like, oh, it probably just, it's just floating around. It's not changing the force. I'm at 0.2. And when I had it at this setting, I don't know if it was default or whatever, it... Look at the number. It's like completely throwing off what I was trying to do. Because the line scale three works. It just, it, not if you don't do it right. Like, see how it's going up, but then it'll settle back down to 0, 0.0, right? So 
I'm gonna keep going here. But it's it's important to understand, like if you're slowly increasing the force on something and you're set to a 10 uh, DIV, that you can get to 30, let's see, 40. So like that's 0.4, right? That's almost 100 pounds of force. When you let go, negative four, and then it just throw, it throws it off. So I actually just talked to Andy Redrick, and he explained why this feature exists. You actually only want this when there's a huge temperature change to be expected. If there isn't, then or just a minimal temperature difference, then you would want to keep it off like I suggested. So if your unit of measurement is pounds of force, it changes two, four, six, eight, ten. That's the division that it has. And so if you have 0.5 set, if it just changes one pound, then it'll stay consistent. If you set the division to 10, that means it has to change more than 20 pounds before it'll actually start reading a different number. So just great feature to have in some situations. Just be aware of that if your number is, seems to be floating around, it might be because in your user settings, you have auto zero tracking set. Just put it to off unless you specifically need it to stay at a specific number, which could throw off the other number. Go into service. You don't need to play in here very much, if ever. Resetting absolute zero resets to the factory zero from when it was first made. You don't want to touch that or it's probably going to throw everything off because that might have been off. If you need to reset absolute zero for whatever reason, then you click enter there, you click up, and I don't want to do that because my zero is perfectly fine. The only way you can calibrate something is if you have another very accurate measuring device and a way to create force. But if you did simple calibration, it would ask you what the zero is, and then it would ask you what uh, one number is around 10 or 13 or so, and then you say, okay, now. And then between zero and 13 is where it does the math. And that's not going to be nearly as accurate as if you did a linear calibration where it has seven or eight points of data from zero to two to four to 10 to 20. And then it can be able to do the math a lot more accurate. So you don't need to touch any of those. Don't need to touch any of those. Uh, factor reset. There you go. Don't touch, uh, don't touch any of that. So for every pixel that is used on this OLED display requires battery as, as opposed to the LED screen. So the more pixels it's using, the more battery it's gonna drain. So this is the minimum power save mode and that's why everything's bigger. If I did the maximum, the display would be smaller. But you can see that it's locked, battery, that it's not recording, and Bluetooth, and it's current force. Now, in order to undo this, you push menu and zero, you push the same time, and it comes back to life. If I want it to go into lock mode because I'm done touching it, I touch both of them at the same time. Therefore, I go into my menu, I go into settings, auto power save and lock. I usually have this, eh, yeah, quite a, while, quite a while. There we go. 200 seconds is super good enough. And I go back. And if I want from here to lock my screen, because I know I'm done with it, but I want to keep my unit on, I go like that. Now, this thing will shut itself off after an hour because that's what I've set it to if nothing changes on here. As far as the rating goes, the PPE recommendation, do not exceed 10 kilonewtons. This is if you're going to use it to hold your body. You should not put more than 10 kilonewtons on your body anyways. But... If you are going to put more than 25 on this, I don't think you can use it for a PPE uh, equipment anymore. And that is according to PPE standard 5.7.3. But when does it stop working? If you take it over 30 or 35 kilonewtons, your thing might not be fully calibrated. You have permanent deformation in the aluminum at some point. Not, not too bad, I've figured. Um, that I've been able to see, but you would have to recalibrate it possibly in order to make sure that what you have is accurate. Now, it was shocking to me that when we took this thing up to, what, 90 or 100 KN, and then like the soft shackle broke in our brake test video, 
the screen was still functional, but you'll notice that it was reading negative three because the aluminum was permanently deformed. Uh, I could probably recalibrate that one uh, if but I obviously broke it, but don't abuse it too much. What's nice though, the Rock Exotica Enforcer, I, I took it, I was right, like it goes from 17 to 20 kilonewtons so quick when you're pulling on something. It's like, bloop, and that was over. And it just said overloaded. And it's just, it just sucked that it's such an expensive device was just like all of a sudden no good. At kind of a, a, the forces I was trying to play in, right? Because if you're trying to break any carabiner or webbing, you need it to break in the 20 range. Uh, a lot of carabiners, I mean, some of them will break at 32, but let's say you use this. Don't recommend it for that, but let's say you use this um, and, you, and you touch 29, should be fine. It's just a lot of the roped goods, any, uh, any rope in a knot, eight to eight, yeah, 20 at the most. Dynamic ropes are 14 kilonewtons. Let's get into how not to use this. Because uh, a lot of people are wanting to break test stuff with it, which I think is actually a good tool for some stuff, especially when I'm traveling and I'm trying to do more of a mobile setup or I'm testing cams in real rock. You can't have a load cell with a cable coming out of it going to a computer. There's things you can do to not damage this. Knowing what your thing is going to break at before you break it helps. If you don't know, it's nice to have a fuse. Fuse in the system could be something like um, this. And like we said, I think before, this is rated for 22 in a basket. I'd be shocked if you get 40. Um, but let's say you get realistically 35. You don't really want your fuse breaking at a point where this is compromised. I would almost say that you want your fuse to break. If you could get a reliable 25 kilonewtons, then that is uh, that would be amazing. Now, this might be around 20, but it depends on you tie it. It depends on how fast you're pulling. This is a little too strong because this is like 50 kilonewtons. It doesn't have to be this long. I find a uh, one inch tubular webbing and a water knot around this thing would uh, break consistently at 25. If you're gonna clip your life to it, clip, clip it direct. But if you're trying to break test things that might be stronger than you realize, then you would want to put this fuse in there. You don't want the fuse in there if your body's attached to it. What's nice is this will pull on the line scale three in a nice even way. And you can have one on either side permanently set up super cheap. If you're only using this much, you can cut it off if it got too tight. Uh, you can just put it off to the side if you're using it for something else. If you're going to tie into this, you could always clip the carabiner to it. Ideally, it's an oval carabiner if you're going to be clipping yourself to this thing. And you kind of want to have, I don't redundancy. What I like to do for redundancy is I like to bypass it. So if I am tying in with a climbing rope, I'll tie the climbing rope into this. Let's say I'm rope swinging or taking whippers at a gym. You could clip the, the figure eight to the top here where the rope terminates right here. And then you can attach yourself to the line scale three with either, I don't know, two lockers or, or soft shackle or whatever. And you put it through your, your two hard points, which is where you would have tied your rope anyways. Now, oftentimes I'll take, well, not this exact one, but this exact length. And I will go through two points and I will go through it twice. So it's not to make it stronger. This is plenty strong enough. But what happens when you double wrap something is it's not too wide, especially at this diameter. It makes it to where this head doesn't want to come off. It's like way more secure. And you can take a little bit of climbing tape and you put it around the throat and it is not coming off. But then again, it's not your only way of being tied in. Oftentimes, I will still tie a figure eight to the top, but I'll have a really long tail. And you'll see this in all my rope swing and, and jump videos I'm falling. That really long tail is directly tied into me, loosely. That way I only have one soft shackle. That way I can use a simple soft shackle. Keeps it uh, um, tight and compact and close to me. Now, you don't want to have, for God's sakes, this permanent sling here and this, and you're like, oh, it's strong enough, I'm gonna tie in direct. Where are your teeth? You don't wanna hit that, all right? So don't have the line scale be able to hit your face. 
you you want to have this thing if it's tied to you you want to have it as close to this as possible so it's here don't hurt this either we're, we're talking about not hurting this but don't hurt this <laughs> so one thing in iceland that happened when we were pulling to break uh an ice screw and all the other ice screws were breaking low so you I kind of got lazy uh what happened was our tension side our fuse broke um and so instead of line scale flying this way which i was ready for which is tying a little um a rope to the eye loosely to an ice screw above or a bolt above or a cam above or something above or to the top of the tree so it's like a loose thing so as soon as it goes it goes boom and it's like higher than what you were working what you were doing because when things come out they kind of like go down they'll like boom and this gets pulled up anyways not that hard to figure that out but when it went the other way i had nothing to stop it from going forward and hitting the um glacier and so that's what cracked uh, the line scale and damaged the screen which is why it looks like this well technically this is another accident i had we'll get into that in a minute so you want to protect with a safety cord potentially going the opposite way you kind of just want to spider web this thing in place loosely so wherever it ends up flying it like hovers in space all of a sudden the next thing is uh, i've had pelican cases or knockoff pelican cases i tried one of the um line grip boxes where i would drill like a half circle here at the top and now i have access to um this part and it's shrouded by protective case even the aluminum case, I want to do that now, uh, because if you're brake testing something, it's going from zero to very fast, very fast, and you don't want it, the meat to slide out of the sandwich. And so something I've been trying to do is create a bag that has padding all around it. So what it's doing is it's kind of hovering inside of a bag full of some sort of a padding. Uh, Decker, our dummy, uh, we cut them up. And because I was going to dispose of them, I was lots of reasons I don't need that dummy now. Um, I like going with the weights. I took the guts out of them, which is a bunch of cut up cloth. And I made a bag and it's more or less a bag of stuffing. Well, in order to access this thing, in order to make it easy to, to work in, I had a pillowcase that I slipped this in and, and then you cut a hole on either end. And it's kind of a pain in the ass, but it protects it. So the more padding you can surround this thing and the more padding you can, if you do hard foam with a hole, then it can't fall out of the end because that's the biggest thing that you need to protect is it sliding out of the end when it's falling really hard and also when it's smacking around. So you create a big hug of foam for it. And if we can perfect that, I will update this part of the video. Another option is to not let this move. So you can put this on the back of the pulleys, for example, and uh, especially if you have two line scales, you can put it behind the pulleys and in front and you can see if it's uh, giving you the same information or if you're losing something between all that jerking around with the pulleys. Because if the line scales hovered in space and you have the, the pulleys there and it's just kind of like not going to go anywhere or you can pat it carefully or something to where it's not flying everywhere, then, uh, then it's easier to protect. Now, same concept with the drop tower that I have now. Right now, it's a three-foot diameter tree with a all-thread, seven-eighths inch all-thread going all the way through it. And that way, I have just a nut and a washer on the end of it. It's only sticking out about that much. So what I do is I put a soft shackle just over the all-thread. And then I put a soft shackle, not this long, on there. So it's perpendicular to the tree. It sits nice against the tree. And it's I don't set it just on the all-thread. I like to have the it's soft. I like it to maybe wiggle it around a little if the sample wants to fall around. And uh, it basically doesn't move. The sample is dropping. This is this is not going to break. I don't need it to break. If I'm worried about my sample overloading this, to, like most drop tests do not get 35 kilonewtons. It's really hard to generate that with under 200 pounds of weights unless you're dropping it on a very static thing with a very factor two fall. But then because I have a soft shackle on there, it wants to smack the tree. So I'm gonna put a little foam thing behind this and that should protect it. 
the screen won't be getting hit because the tree is overhanging. So whatever I lift above the tree uh, with a girth hitch sling up there and a pulley going to a, a winch, when it lifts up, it's always not going to hit this. So uh, it is also part of my mobile setup where I have a five to one with a lot of friends or a five to one pulley system with a capstan winch in order to pull things up to, let's say, 20, 25 kilonewtons out in the field. That is a lot of work to set up. And so uh, if you're going to do that, it's better to do a five to one than try to get crazy with the multipliers on the pulleys and just have more people help you pull. Uh, you could also do a five to one with a truck. Um, the idea behind that is you drive slowly in the truck. You have somebody monitoring it. But you're also not putting too much force on your truck because you're pulling the, just the tail. But the other thing is you can pull like at a 45 degree angle. So you're not, you don't want to pull in line of the thing that's bringing the sample to you. You don't, you don't want to have like a come along because that chain or the cable that's like doing the come, it's like, whack. Even if you put like something heavy over it, you don't want to be in line with the object. So something to be mindful if you are breaking something, even though that's not specific to the line scale. I definitely recommend using the app if you are doing a slow pull so you keep track of what's going on, especially if you're using a pulley system and a cap stand where you cannot feel the force. So uh, definitely monitor that if you can, but don't try to get close to this and be like, oh, what's the number? Let me show you the app. The Line Scale 2 app is the one that works for the Line Scale 3. It is not on the Play Store, so the link will be in the description below. So you can download it straight from the website. And it works for Android and iOS. Once more units are sold and investors are paid back, then more money can be applied to making the app better. But it works super good enough at the moment. Connect a Line Scale. And right now it's reading the A408. 67, that one. There we go. And now you can see that the Bluetooth icon is on. Back. Zero. Peak mode. There we go. Zero. All right. So let's start squeezing. So you can see that's working well. Now, the thing that I didn't realize when I went to go use this the first time is it's not sending data over at 1,280 hertz a second. It is sending every point of data over into the app. It's not recording internally and sending over the information with a slow delay. Uh, therefore, this is only going to record up to 40 hertz, which is perfectly fine if you're not dropping things. Anyways. If you want to do the alarm, which is, I think, one of the best features of this. Oh, gosh, that's set at zero. Let's change that first. Let's say uh, 0 0.75, because I know I can squeeze that, on, I don't know. <laughs> God, I can only imagine what these ringtones are. <laughs> so if I go, oh, wow, that's a funny sound. There we go. Let's just stick with the beep. Now the Bluetooth is going to work up to 20 meters, right? If you set uh, alarms on the high lines at GGBY, then you can't go back up to camp to your car, which is a quarter mile away and think this is going to work. But what you can do is you can set peak force. And if there's a windstorm, you can come back and see if it's like 8.5 kilonewtons. And that would be a problem. Uh, and then you would know you have a problem. Bluetooth 4 actually will go up to 50 meters with direct sight of the phone to the display. So the Bluetooth, it cannot be transmitted through the body. So if this is face down and you're above it, it's not gonna work as good. So especially the further you get. So if you're pointing it straight like that, you might get 50 meters or 163 feet of range. Um, the log. So now it's recording and this is completely independent from the log that's happening in here, which is great. You can see what's happening. So let's, uh, Let's pulse this thing. <laughs> can't <laughs> pop the finger now. Okay. I think that's pretty cool. Load. Now I've got my CSV files here. Anyways, you can play with these. You can go to here. 
you can export and you could send it to wherever. So that is, that is something you'd want to play with before you actually need it. It doesn't take that much to figure out how it works, but that is an option. If I set an alarm for 0.75, it's going to basically record based on that. If I turn my alarm off, it's going to record with, I think, 30 kilonewtons as the entire bar. So if I want to squeeze this, squeeze it, squeeze it, you'll see my peak force here. And let's say I turn on peak force on this guy. So that way they're talking to each other. You can see that 0.8 was um, recorded in here and you have that as an option. You can hit zero there. It does not reset it there. You have to touch it and reset it there. Now let's say I wanna join the other line scale, connect to others. I've got a 6ACD08 and go back and I can reset that. And now it's reading this line scale. If I want to go back, connect to others, connect my line scale to 6708, push back, and there you go. So you can jump back and forth to different line scales if you've got them in the system in different spots. Now let's pull the data off of this and make a graph with it. So you set this in the part shows that and it has the 10 logs shows you your progress it shows if any have failed and this can take a long time if you have 1280 hertz at 30 seconds a pop it can actually take 20 30 minutes sometimes if i let this get too full before i take anything out so all you have to do now is take that out and you can put in your computer now let me show you this before i put it back in is let's say i add one log to this and that's going to give me an extra one now does it pull all 11 off of there again and fill this up no it'll only add the one single log to this so again i'm going to put this back in and let's say oh this is going to take a while i don't want to do that long hold that and it's canceled then you can remove your stick you don't want to pull this out you risk damaging it if uh, you pull it out obviously well it's working like any usb stick but now let's stick it back in let's get all those logs okay so that's done i can pull it out and that should only have 11 total logs on this uh even though i've stuck it in several times so the maximum amount of data you can have is 50 hours if you've recorded at 10 hertz or half an hour at 1280 hertz which is a ton of data especially if it's only like 15 seconds with a three pre-record. It's just crazy that much information for your computer to have to deal with, which means this is going to get just, it's going to take a while. So I just, if you're done with a test, you're done with something, pull it out. Don't let it get too big. Okay. So this is what it looks like. That's the date. And notice that I have 11 items. It did have to go through the whole system every time, but it didn't like put it on there three times, four times. So those are all my things. I'm gonna open up just one of them. I'm gonna open up right off the memory stick since it's not that big. And let's go off of here. Uh, let's do numbers. At the top, you can see the ID of the unit you had, which is pretty helpful if you've got a whole bunch going on. Date, time, the log number it pulled off, which so this was the 11th one. It was in kilonewtons, relative mode, relative zero was that, speed, all this stuff. It's great. I just go shift, command, down, and that's basically all the data. And I go chart with the lines. That is just the simplest thing. When I got 1280 hertz, I do the same thing. Now, it's not super clean graph, but what I found that if I just keep making it smaller and I expand it, it actually doesn't look too bad. Now, these values get pretty small, but if I'm trying to just screenshot um, a graph for uh, my videos, I just do that. Now, that's a pretty boring one. Let's, uh, let's open up one I pulsed it on. So you can see here that I was pulsating it, and what triggered it 
was 0.75. So maybe that triggered it. But you can see here that it was the three seconds before that it also recorded it, that it wasn't just starting right there at that top peak. So that's a nice, nice feature. And then I kept pushing, push, pushing. And so Andrew Redrick confirms that the Python script does work with the latest firmware 2.640. And if you are going to do a batch of graphs or you accidentally logged 99 logs that were wrong and you only had one that was right, that actually can be very helpful because then you just graph all of them, scan and be like, ah, oh, it was the 17th or it was the first one that actually had the information I wanted. I don't know if this is left on or not. I quickly bo push both. It did not wake up. Therefore, I know it's off. This is the other one. And I just push both to be in low power mode because let's say I want to keep it on. But this is why this was not in <laughs> the main video where I broke it. Because this was probably boring for anybody who doesn't have one of these in their hand to play with and has not struggled up to this point and been like, man, I wish I knew some of this stuff. Hopefully this was helpful for you. And please check the description because I'm going to put other people's videos in there, notes. If it's not worth re-uploading this, I'm not going to. If it's a minor thing, I'm not going to make changes to this. It's important that you see the description in order to have all the information up to date. I Hopefully, uh, this will end up on Linescale's website as well. But um, thank you for supporting this project and being interested and being as nerdy as I am with this because... Uh, Without you, these wouldn't exist. So, thank you.